Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to our first social justice faculty lecture series. This lecture series is intended to, to really show the um, awesome power of our UCSB faculty while also providing students and counselors and teachers tools to help them understand and, and really navigate this increasingly complex social world. So we're super excited to be having you here today. Our first presenter is, is an amazing professor here at UCSB in the Office of Asian American Studies. His name is Professor John Park. And I'd like to give him you know, some virtual handshakes you know, in, in, in class. And, um, and thank you for coming, Dr. Park. Yes, of course. I'll say finally, uh, any questions can go in the Q&A box and, and questions about this particular session, if we can save towards the end, there'll be time to answer questions and, and, and Dr. Parker is happy to have dialogue with you. So if we could save questions until the end of the presentation. And without further ado, we can get started. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, as many of you are new to this format, I'm also uh, pretty new to the format. And I'd like to thank my colleagues in student affairs, especially in the Office of Admissions, uh, for inviting me to speak to you. And I gather most of you are not in college, uh, that most of you are teachers, high school students, and so on. Uh, and so I've organized this presentation to help introduce you to uh, things that faculty members and students do uh, at a research university like UCSB. And as you can see, I'm a professor of Asian American Studies uh, and Sociology. I've been here for a while. Uh, I've been here since 2002. Um, and by training and so on, and, and by the way, all of our faculty members here at UC Santa Barbara, we have websites, uh, dedicated websites that um, highlight our research and our work. So if you just type John Park UCSB, my entire professional life uh, will flash before you. Yeah, uh, as part of my work, uh, I'm primarily trained in archival history, but as part of my work, I've been teaching a class, a lower division class, on immigration policy uh, in the United States since 1965. Um, and because that's the most general class, I thought that uh, uh, I would share materials uh, from that class with you uh, today, right? And um, that class has been so influential and so fun uh, that I've written a book about it. I've written um, additional materials about migration trends uh, in the United States since 1965. <clears throat> that's a picture of me. Uh, that's a picture of my daughter. Uh, and that's our dog um, in Santa Barbara. And I'm in Santa Barbara right now, right? And um, yeah, as for the class uh, and as for uh, the whole approach, it's um, for a long time now, for the last two and a half decades, I've been doing research on immigration law, migration trends. Uh, most of the work has been based in the late 19th uh, and early part of the 20th century. Uh, but this class, uh, after 1965, which is set after 1965, uh, it's uh, such a fun class because it helps explain why the United States looks the way it does. Uh, why there's a, a kind of like a before and after. Uh, and it's the, uh, the Immigration Act of 1965 is so significant, largely because it was the first uh, race neutral immigration law in American history. So before 1965, uh, Asians had been excluded from the United States. Uh, the early framers of the Constitution uh, were worried about the population of slaves and African persons, so they they had set limits on that. Uh, they didn't even care for many of the Southern or Eastern Europeans that came to the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. So the United States had had a long history of restrictions uh, against immigrants. Uh, and really, uh, uh, citizenship, American citizenship, for people who were not born in the United States, that was really reserved for free white persons under the uh, Naturalization Act in 1790. And as you can see, I mean, uh, some of the illustrations that you see in my presentation. By the way, I probably should have told you this before. I've, I've been working in uh, race and law, immigration law for a long, long time. Uh, and so I've developed a kind of uh, strange sense of humor around these materials, right? And uh, I should have warned you that some of the images are a little jarring, uh, but they are amusing. I mean, this is um, the illustration of the, the Chinese guy in San Francisco Bay. Uh, that comes to us from the late 19th century. It was originally published in The, the Wasp. Uh, and it shows, uh, you know, the bad things that could happen in San Francisco uh, if Asians continue to come there. 
Uh, and in the late 19th and early part of the 20th century, uh, California really was the heart of an anti-Chinese movement. Right, so in the class that I teach about the Immigration Act of 1965, we spend about a week or two uh, discussing uh, just immigration rules before 1965, uh, just how uh, race specific uh, they were, uh, how uh, immigration rules like the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, really were not subtle in terms of the kind of message uh, that they sent uh, to prospective immigrants. And by 1917 and 1924 uh, in the United States, uh, Congress draws a map really around all of Asia and calls it the Asiatic Barred Zone. Uh, the Asiatic Barred Zone, again, is just, uh, you can just hear it uh, in the words. People from uh, Asia were not supposed to come to the United States. Uh, and generally in the late 19th and early part of the 20th century, many Americans uh, don't believe that diversity is a good idea. I mean, and, and this is, uh, uh, <clears throat> oftentimes nowadays when you go to a college campus, uh, the administrators, you know, people like uh, Mr. Mathis uh, will say, oh, diversity is great. Uh, diversity is wonderful. Isn't it great that all of you are gonna live together even though you're coming from such different backgrounds? Uh, that is a relatively new insight, <laughs> which is like, you know, uh, for most of American history uh, up through World War II, uh, many Americans did not think uh, that diversity was such a good idea that it could lead to kind of a catastrophe. And, and again, in Europe uh, and in Asia in the late 19th and early part of the 20th century, uh, many nation states are uh, not especially moving uh, toward diverse uh, citizenship. Uh, and in fact are expelling people uh, for various ethnic, religious, uh, and race-based reasons. That's why um, thinking about the Immigration Act of 1965 is so critical. Uh, by the post-war period um, in the United States, uh, as part of the American Civil Rights Movement, uh, many more Americans are insisting uh, that the United States dismantle uh, race-based segregation, uh, that it move uh, public law into more um, um, less white supremacist and overtly white supremacist forms, right? So the image uh, that you see of Dr. King there, <clears throat> the Immigration Act of 1965 really does squarely fit within the American Civil Rights Movement, uh, where many, many more Americans are pushing uh, Congress and President uh, to be more, well, I mean, I think to be less white supremacist uh, than in the period before. Uh, and in order to appreciate the Immigration Act of 1965 and the uh, significance of that particular reform, we do really need a historical context. And so that's, that's what these images and that's what the, the first two weeks of the class are really about. And really after 1965, um, patterns of migration to the United States really do change. Uh, many more people uh, who are not from Europe uh, and many more people who are from Mexico Central America and from Asia uh, come to the United States. And curiously, many of the people uh, from Asia and from Mexico, um, they come to the United States largely because the United States went to their countries first. Uh, and by that, what I mean is like, uh, uh, but during World War II, the United States federal government sent its own public officials to Mexico to recruit large numbers of farm laborers. They were called braceros. Uh, they were brought um, in conjunction with the United States State Department, the Department of Labor. Uh, and it was during this moment when so many Americans were sending troops uh, and so many Americans were deployed in war in two major theaters in Europe uh, and then in the Pacific. This caused massive labor shortages in the United States. Many growers in the American Southwest uh, asked uh, the United States government for assistance in finding laborers who could work in the fields. Uh, the United States sent representatives to Mexico uh, and designed a program that over the next uh, 30 years, even after the war, um, <clears throat> built an infrastructure to bring Mexicans uh, to come work in, in California agriculture uh, and in agriculture in the Southwest. The book on the lower left that you see here, that's by my colleague, uh, Professor Chavez Garcia uh, in the history department. And it's about her father uh, and it's about her father and her uh, mother uh, and how they came to the United States. And he himself was a, was a bracero and he was 
uh, one of several hundreds of thousands of uh, Mexicans uh, who came to the United States and instead of going back to Mexico uh, at the end of their labor contracts, they eventually decided to settle uh, in California uh, and in Texas and in Arizona. Now, uh, after the Immigration Act of 1965, when Congress makes, uh, makes it possible all of a sudden for uh, people who are not European uh, to come to the United States, um, Professor Chavez's family uh, is one of the many uh, hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of, of families that will migrate to the U.S. For Asians, um, it's a kind of similar pattern. So many of the Asians and, and large numbers of Asians who come to the United States after 1965 are in some ways connected to the United States military presence in Asia in the period before. And um, as some of you may know, the United States has had a constant military presence uh, in Asia, uh, beginning in the Philippines, <clears throat> since at least 1900. Uh, in fact, the entire 20th century is a uh, period of, of warfare uh, where the United States has engaged in war uh, in Asia, first in the Philippines, uh, then well, I mean, if you include Hawaii, a specific I would be Hawaii, then the Philippines, uh, then against Japan, uh, and then uh, South Korea, uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, at the, in the wake of the communist victory in China, the United States deployed force uh, to protect Taiwan. So these places, Taiwan, uh, the Philippines, South Korea, uh, one thing that they have is uh, American military presence uh, over time, and especially after 1965, this will result in thousands of Asians from those very places, Philippines, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, including my family, uh, who come to the United States after 1965. Now, uh, after the migration of so many people <laughs> uh, who are not European, uh, many American citizens, and by the way, I mean, before 1960, in the United States Census of California, uh, California was uh, 85, uh, nearly, you know, I mean, it was 85% white. Now, this is, uh, that many of you may be tuning in from uh, various places in California, but can you imagine California, 85, 90% white? It's, uh, uh, it's not the way it looks now. Uh, the way California looks now is really a kind of like a profound uh, function of, uh, the immigration rule that was passed after 1965 and the decades of sustained migration uh, from Mexico, Central America, and from Asian countries uh, that remade uh, places like California. And as these places are remade, uh, not everyone is really pleased with the changes uh, in California. And the uh, displeasures come in two directions. One is uh, many People in California uh, feel like uh, people who shouldn't come uh, to the United States are coming anyway. Uh, so one of the things that the Immigration Act of 1965 attempted to do uh, was to regularize migration with Mexico. So instead of having unfettered, uh, federally sponsored migration of uh, Mexican laborers, that was supposed to limit to 20,000 persons per year. Uh, as uh, Mexico is treated like every other country, though, it's not really the case that the labor pattern uh, uh, stops, uh, even though federal immigration law changes. And so by 1970 and into 1980, uh, what we see is a significant irregular migration across the southern border. Uh, many of those folks are from Mexico. And this uh, cartoon on the left is an illustration of that trend, right? And uh, the cartoon is simply saying that many Mexican uh, immigrants are undeserving. Uh, they are coming not just for the jobs, but for the robust set of social services that are offered in the United States. Right, and the uh, 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 many political leaders, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, insisted uh, that the United States had to do more uh, to stop these irregular flows of, of immigrants. At the same time, by 1990, uh, major American cities are so full of immigrants, many of whom have uh, very little in common, that they are subject to imploding. So uh, this is uh, uh, the image on your right is an image from the Los Angeles riots in 1992. I think many of you who are younger um, uh, <clears throat> would, uh, you weren't even born uh, during this time. So, um, 
Yeah, so you would not remember uh, the riots in 1992. But I think uh, if you are listening and you're a teacher, uh, and if you're, you know, if you're over 30, uh, you would you would remember this, and uh, you would remember just how jarring this was. This was a major American city uh, that imploded, uh, and in 1992, the vast majority of people who were arrested during the Los Angeles riots were Latino. Uh, it was triggered uh, by a verdict uh, involving a African-American motorist, Rodney King, uh, and the uh, police officers who had beaten him, uh, and all of which was uh, recorded. Uh, and I think this uh, recording is still available on YouTube. You can sort of see uh, both the incident that's at the trial, as well as the uh, fact that uh, in 1992, in late April, uh, the police officers who were videotaped recording Rodney King uh, were acquitted of all the charges against them. Uh, what happened later is that for about two and a half weeks, uh, Los Angeles erupted in flames. Uh, when um, order was finally restored into the city, uh, it turned out that a majority of the people who were arrested were not African-American, they were Latino. Uh, a majority of the people who lost businesses uh, were Korean-American, right? I mean, uh, again, you would not have seen this pattern in 1960, uh, and yet by 1990, what was becoming obvious was uh, lots of immigrants from all over the world were living in cities like Los Angeles. And these places, in the words of uh, leading politicians at the time, uh, may be becoming ungovernable. Right. And if you were uh, a person prone to thinking that diversity was a bad idea, uh, Los Angeles in 1992 presented um, a lot of evidence of how diversity just wasn't working. Uh, people were not, in fact, getting along. And in fact, uh, the, the public policies to emerge both before and after uh, the LA riots uh, really were too bad. So by this time in the class, right? So in this class that I've uh, taught for about 20 years, uh, by the fourth and fifth week, uh, we discuss how Congress revisits uh, the Immigration Act of 1965 and makes fundamental changes to it. So in the 1980s and throughout the 1990s, Congress passed new rules uh, that would restrict the migration of the poor, uh, and uh, Congress also passed new rules that would make it easier uh, for wealthier people uh, and for educated people uh, to come to the United States. And by the way, a lot of these rules were um, bipartisan, right? So uh, these are some of the leading policymakers of the time. So this is, you know, I mean, the presidents you'd be familiar with, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, uh, George W. Bush, uh, the senators, Alan Simpson uh, from Wyoming, Ted Kennedy from Massachusetts. Uh, Barbara Jordan uh, was one of the most progressive members of the United States House of Representatives. She came to national attention during the, uh, the Watergate hearings in the 1960s. But, you know, Barbara Jordan was a very, very progressive person. Uh, she argued in the 1980s and in the 1990s, immigration law should change. Uh, we shouldn't admit so many poor folks. Um, we should admit people based on uh, how they would help uh, the United States and its economy, right? So she served on a committee that rewrote, uh, that helped to rewrite uh, immigration rules throughout the 1990s. Uh, toward those uh, with skills and capital, uh, and really to make it harder uh, for people, especially coming under family unification categories, coming under refugee categories. These were people who were more likely to be poor uh, to make it harder for them to migrate to the United States. So we do spend uh, about a week or two discussing how public law changes in light of what were um, a kind of political discomfort uh, with the, uh, the, the waves of migration after 1965. And the rest of the class is really about that. It's about how, um, you know, so much of law and policy, especially the kind of law and policy that we discuss at the university, it's about unintended consequences. So when Congress passes the Refugee Act in 1980, uh, when it passes rules against um, uh, poor immigrants in 1986, uh, and then again in 1990, Congress fully expected that it could do something about these things, right, and limit the number of people uh, who were poor from coming to the United States. I think one of the more surprising developments over the last two or three decades is that even when nation states passed harsher rules against poor immigrants, 
lots of poor folks came anyway. Right? And it showed uh, in some ways the limits of public law, right? So uh, by building physical obstacles, by making refugee admissions harder, um, what the United States may have done uh, is push people who were poor into illegal pathways uh, to the United States to take uh, greater risks, uh, sometimes to engage uh, criminal organizations to help smuggle them into the United States. Uh, one thing is for sure, in 1980, uh, the population of people who were out of status, like not lawfully supposed to be in the United States, was pro probably about a million persons. By 1990, that number was about 3 million persons. Ten years later, uh, it was about 6 million persons. And then by 2010, it was at least uh, uh, 12 million persons. So uh, at a uh, period where American public law became uh, so much more restrictive uh, for legal immigrants uh, to come to the United States, the population of people who were out of status, who were illegally in the United States, uh, uh, doubled every 10 years, right? I, I think that this is something that many students struggle to get their minds around, right? And uh, we discuss why that is true. I mean, like uh, in terms of um, the infrastructure of the world, right? The way uh, it's so easy for us to travel uh, and traverse international boundaries uh, suggests the extent to which uh, when nation states try to impose hard boundaries around their territories, it often does, doesn't work, right? What it does do is it uh, creates very complex pathways uh, through which poor people and smaller uh, fractions of poor people. I mean, and this is this is uh, such an important part of the class, right? Uh, one of the most important parts of the class is to convey uh, to college students, many of whom are from uh, uh, particularly more affluent backgrounds, is to convey the idea for the sense that that's not normal. Like the, the vast majority of people around the world uh, live um, at or near poverty. Uh, about two to three billion people live in near abject poverty. So uh, they do not earn incomes high enough to meet the necessities of life, right? At the same time, uh, we have a vast infrastructure of roads, airports, uh, and transportation that knit uh, places that are very, very far apart uh, together. So it's that traveling these vast distances is not difficult anymore. Uh, and in light of that, all nation states uh, that, that have passed rules against the poor uh, have largely not uh, really stopped the migration of the poor. If anything, it's driven uh, that migration underground uh, and in toward illegality. And so that's uh, a, a huge theme uh, in the class, right? And it's about the unintended consequences of migration against the poor. At the same time, you know, um, and this is the, a part of the class that's probably changed the most. At the same time, the United States, uh, through rules in 1965, uh, and then again in 1990, uh, and then again in 1998 and 2000, uh, the United States has really enlarged pathways uh, for people who are highly skilled, uh, for people who are educated, even for people seeking uh, higher education. The United States has never been more open than ever before. We are a major research university here at UCSB. Uh, in this part of the class, I show how uh, about a third of our tenured faculty are people who are born abroad. <laughs> a gigantic uh, number of our international students are some of the uh, best students around the world. Uh, migrating for them, uh, coming to a UC campus, finishing a college degree has really never been easier. Uh, in the history of the University of California. And you can see that um, patterns of migration uh, for the educated and for the skilled have been especially robust. And nowhere has this been more true than in Asia. And, and this is in large part um, related to what I had told you earlier, that the connections between the United States and Asian countries uh, developed throughout the 20th century in such ways that uh, traveling from Seoul uh, to acquire a college degree in the United States was not really that big a deal uh, by 1990. Uh, finding a decent job uh, was not that big a deal uh, from Asia to the United States. And these kinds of patterns, uh, for example, uh, in the Philippines, 
uh, medical schools in the Philippines, uh, they date to the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the United States Navy helped uh, construct many of those. Uh, the original purpose was to uh, help American sailors get over tropical diseases, right? But once the Americans build medical schools and nursing schools in the Philippines, uh, and then change their rules to favor highly skilled migration after 1965. I would dare you to find an American hospital where you wouldn't find Filipino nurses and physicians. Uh, that migration has been so robust, that it's been so consistent, uh, that that migration has also really remade the United States. And I think this is a, a very captivating and fascinating topic to teach at a UC campus because all UC campuses have lots of Asian students. They are often the sons and daughters of highly skilled uh, and educated professionals who are coming to the United States. And so in this period that is so nativist and so restrictive against people who are poor, um, for people who are skilled, for people who have opportunities, the United States has never been more open. And <clears throat> it's not just the professors at UC Santa Barbara uh, who are uh, immigrants. You know, uh, uh, Chancellor Yang, uh, he is from Taiwan. Uh, his family was from mainland China, but he's from Taiwan. Um, he came to the United States to uh, complete graduate work uh, in engineering. Uh, like many students, he decided to stay. Uh, he went from being an Asian immigrant to an Asian American, right? And he's now the longest serving chancellor uh, in, our, um, in our campus's history. And uh, he has overseen some of the most tremendous changes uh, both to the student body and to um, and to the faculty. And in all of those respects, we've become far more immigrant <laughs> uh, than ever before. Uh, and it's largely uh, both uh, policies to make uh, UCSB an exceptional university and also uh, because of fundamental changes to immigration law uh, that facilitate that kind of uh, that kind of migration. Now, the last part of the course and the last uh, set of themes are about just the profound divisions uh, in American society over uh, issues of, of immigration. Again, uh, the most profound divisions, I think, really are about poor folk and about the, the migration of poor people, uh, about the migration of people who uh, often consider themselves refugees and would present as refugees, would like to make asylum claims, right? So under uh, President Trump, uh, the response to those people has been to separate uh, the parents from their children. Uh, <clears throat> and I know, you know, as an academic, I, I am, um, the culture is not to impose any particular political point of view uh, on my students or anything, but uh, just as a historian, uh, as someone who's studied legal history for a long, long time, that is pretty unprecedented. I, and I, you know, I am, uh, uh, I would be the first to admit that I was surprised that the United States federal government would move to separate parents from children uh, in this particular way. And I. You know, the last time the United States had a public law that allowed families to be separated like that and then removed vast distances uh, where the family members may never see one another again, that was in the late, you know, that was in the middle of the 19th century uh, during slavery, right? So we have a kind of immigration system that in terms of how it treats migrants uh, and treats them as criminals and as people who are not even entitled to family relationships, that I think is, uh, <clears throat> uh, it just measures how extreme uh, policies toward people who are poor uh, have really become, right? And just, uh, you know, uh, his political success, uh, Donald Trump's political success really was based on um, making migration uh, harder, uh, again, for people who are poor. And, and you can sort of see that in the, and in the immigration law in the last 20 years, uh, what's also been striking is there's not been really a comprehensive piece of legislation, right? That uh, the United States Congress uh, and the American president uh, have not come to an agreement about how best to resolve these issues. Uh, the DREAM Act was originally uh, co-sponsored by a Republican senator, you know, uh, Orrin Hatch of Utah. <clears throat> the DREAM Act never uh, became public law. Uh, if you are a person uh, who is out of status, and if you are younger, uh, if you had no idea that you were out of status uh, until you were 
16 or 17 applying for a driver's license or applying to college, even if you, uh, it wasn't your fault uh, that you had this legal disability, uh, we, we haven't really solved that problem, right? Uh, we've instead, both presidents, uh, President Obama and President Trump, uh, have attempted to resolve these problems partially through executive actions, through uh, presidential declarations, uh, not through comprehensive uh, legislation in Congress. And it goes to show just how profoundly divided uh, the United States has become uh, around these issues. You know, and we do spend uh, a lot of time uh, discussing uh, various state rules. And what's been very uh, striking over the last 10 or 20 years has been just the division within the state. So California in the early part of the 1990s used to be a very anti-immigrant state. Now it's probably one of the most immigrant friendly uh, states in terms of access to higher education, right? Uh, alternative forms of identification, uh, all kinds of ways in which California moved from a very right wing position with regard to immigration and immigrants. And now um, uh, is just in the opposite uh, political spectrum, right? So for my students in the class, uh, I think it's important to map uh, and understand uh, those dimensions and to see uh, where all of this is going. And, and that's really the end of the class. I mean, uh, by week nine and 10, we're talking about the future of, um, of American migrations. <clears throat> Some of the topics are pretty good, <laughs> right? Uh, I teach, this class is primarily geared toward first year students, okay? So when I teach this class uh, in the fall, and I'm gonna start teaching this class uh, next week, uh, online. Um, I almost feel like I need to apologize uh, to my young students who are coming to college who are so full of energy and so optimistic about the world. It's as if uh, my class is about uh, intractable problems uh, that the world is facing, right? Uh, if we are, if all nation states are dealing with uh, the migration of displaced and poor people that they do not want, uh, try to imagine how that problem will get worse uh, when the climate continues to change. Uh, when the climate continues to change, uh, as the weaker states uh, begin to fall apart, uh, the migrations that we are likely to see in our future, in your lifetime, uh, may be more severe than anything we've seen before, right? And it raises all kinds of uh, very complex qu uh, questions about the role of nation states, um, uh, whether restriction uh, would even work. Uh, do we want uh, massive uh, populations of people who have no legal status? Uh, do we want that to become an intergenerational problem? Right. So these are the kinds of things that, um, uh, that we discuss toward the end of the class, right? And of course, I mean, part of the reason I'm talking to you like this is because of the pandemic. Uh, and the pandemic uh, is also very illustrative of how uh, just profoundly interconnected uh, the world has become uh, in the early part of the 21st century, right? How the pandemic spread not because poor people uh, were crossing boundaries, but because wealthier people were using airports uh, and bringing uh, uh, the virus uh, through uh, planes <laughs> and through jets and, and by flying, uh, you know, and, the thing about you know, uh, the virus is that it probably originated in Wuhan in China. Uh, Wuhan, China did not have an international airport in 1950, right? Uh, that airport was built in the last 20 years. Uh, uh, it just uh, uh, grew in scale uh, over the last 15 years. And what's interesting is that this novel coronavirus that begins in that corner of the world uh, can spread so quickly now uh, across everywhere, right? And uh, I think that that raises profound issues about how we regulate uh, uh, human migration, right? About the consequences of living in, a, in this interrelated world. And really uh, one of the, the biggest lessons that I like to convey to my students at UC Santa Barbara, especially the younger ones coming, is that um, this is a research university, and, and, and by that, what I mean is that uh, all of my colleagues in the sciences, the humanities, uh, but especially in the social sciences, we, we're all studying problems that really don't have obvious solutions, uh, either politically or, or um, practically. I mean, uh, we are looking and studying these problems uh, and oftentimes devoting our entire lives to the study of these problems. 
And a major research university like this one uh, is really a place where younger people, we invite you uh, to study these things with us, right? And because, <laughs> and many of you, I, I think, um, I don't need to persuade you of this, but uh, many of you, I think, if just watching the news uh, will realize that the grown-ups haven't really figured everything out. <laughs> the grown-ups are uh, completely divided. Uh, they cannot agree upon basic things. Uh, we live in a world uh, full of contention, yeah. Um, a research university like this one uh, exists in part uh, to structure those conversations, uh, to give them some shape, uh, to give scholars time and space uh, to think through these things. And the ultimate goal of that exercise is to produce a world or create a world uh, that's better than the one that we uh, come into. Uh, that's, the, um, that's the spirit of the university. That is where it could be the most successful and the most helpful uh, to our world. Many college students think that they're going to college primarily for their own sake, right? It's to improve their income or to, um, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, I mean, they, they think that college is a, primarily a kind of like a personal journey. Uh, the longer I am a professor at the university, the more inclined uh, I am to convey sort of the opposite message, that the college, the university, it's not really about us as professors or as students. It's about the society and our world. It's the kind of place that we share and how can we make those places better off uh, than when we found them. Yeah, uh, that's what the class is about. Uh, it's about, yeah, and it's about just how, um, on the one hand, it is exceptionally depressing. Many of the, the problems that uh, I've studied for a long, long time uh, are exceptionally depressing. And yet, you know, I am never more hopeful than in the fall <laughs> than when those students come to campus, uh, when they bring their energy uh, to us. And um, that's just a wonderful thing to think through uh, these complex problems together. Okay, so I should, uh, I would like to stop there. And uh, I know I can see that there are seven open questions or so on, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Park, so much for this presentation. I, I know there, well, there's eight, there's eight questions in here now, mm -hmm. um, all pertaining to, to, to your, to your um, lecture. Okay, so I can go through them. So, uh, uh, Ms. Steubenrock? Uh, okay, so I'm sorry if I mispronounce uh, your name, but uh, have you heard of an experiment in Louisiana during Reconstruction uh, with an attempt to re-enslave Chinese? Yeah, uh, so uh, in the wake of uh, abolition, uh, so after the Emancipation Proclamation and 13th Amendment, uh, planters in Louisiana hatched a plan uh, to replace African slaves with Chinese laborers. Uh, and the, uh, the leading historian uh, whose book I would uh, recommend uh, is Moon Ki Chung. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Washington. Uh, he wrote about that, <laughs> he wrote about these schemes uh, through which affluent white folks uh, thought they could exchange one uh, um, literally captive workforce uh, for a pliant uh, workforce of Asians, right? And that, uh, you know, and, and it raises these kinds of profound uh, questions about, um, oh, for example, here, let me go back a few slides. You remember George W. Bush? George W. Bush, when he was in office, uh, uh, got the news that, wow, you know, we might have climate change, but it might be a thing, uh, that it's not a hoax. Uh, and he said, in a very famous speech, he said that um, the United States may have an addiction to oil. And that, that's a striking thing coming from a Texan uh, like him, uh, who had business interests in oil and gas and so on. Uh, but what George Bush was saying is that the United States really should think about weaning itself uh, from the addiction uh, to oil. Uh, in other speeches, other presidents have suggested the same kind of idea, which is that the United States may have long had an addiction to cheap labor, uh, even captive labor. Right, that if we think about slavery, uh, when we think about uh, uh, poor uh, laborers in general, the United States has always relied on uh, people who are impoverished uh, to do the work, uh, the very hard work of producing our food, producing our 
uh, materials that are necessary for life, right? And I think in California, uh, it's very easy to see that. I mean, we all intuitively know, I think, that, um, you know, that, that many of the people who are uh, picking our food, who are uh, essential to our food supply, are uh, poor people. Uh, is it possible that we have an addiction uh, to poor laborers? right, as a core part of our economy. And <clears throat> instead of legalizing that, uh, uh, one thing that uh, we may have done as a nation is to uh, render it illegal uh, and drive uh, these poor folks um, further and further into the margins of our society, uh, thus uh, enhancing the possibility of their exploitation. Right, so I think, Ms. Uh, Steubenrock, my, my reply to your question would be that, um, the United States has had a long history of doing that, and, and we might be seeing that uh, in, in the patterns of migration that we see now. Right. So uh, I think it's Ms. I, and I hope that answers your question. Uh, Ms. Lopez asked, does California being 80% white, uh, including Hispanic Latinos who identify as white? In a part, yes. Okay, so a lot of the census categories, even now, um, they're self-reporting categories, right? And uh, um, one of the things, uh, <clears throat> Mexican Americans and persons of Mexican ancestry in California, uh, I tell my own students, is that uh, in the 19th century, um, many of them did identify as white, right? And uh, under the tree of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1849, uh, Mexicans who owned land in California, uh, who did not want to repatriate to Mexico, could keep their lands. They could pass into American citizenship and they could be white. I'm here sitting here in Santa Barbara. Um, uh, uh, many people in Santa Barbara who were Mexican uh, and California and elites, uh, they claimed whiteness. Uh, and so all the way through uh, the 1950 and 1960 census, uh, many of those folks who were wealthier, uh, who were property, uh, they did pass into white. And so, yes, it did include uh, Hispanic or Latino who identified as white. But they would not identify identifying as white. They would not identify as Latino, right? So uh, oftentimes, um, you know, persons of Mexican ancestry. And, and Mexico, you know, uh, in this part of the class, when we're talking about braceros, Mexico is a big place. Uh, what was distinctive about the Braceros or about agricultural workers uh, was that, or that many of them were indigenous Mexican. Uh, they were not, um, they did not trace their ancestry to Europe. And in Mexico, uh, many of the people who were the landed elite, uh, they did claim ancestry uh, in Europe. Uh, they often frame themselves as lighter skinned and as white, right, against the larger population of, of um, indigenous Mexicans who they, they regarded as non-white. A lot of the non-white uh, uh, folks, a lot of the indigenous Mexicans were the ones who were recruited as Bracero. So in the United States, <clears throat> by the 1930s and 1940s, uh, there is a language in the United States where Mexicans are associated with being non-white, right? And uh, Mexican uh, and persons of Mexican ancestry are, in, are unusual in American public law because they are an example of a, a group of people who go from being in a white category uh, into a non-white category, right? And uh, in places like California, by 1950, race-based segregation uh, treats Mexicans as non-white. Right, so I, and I hope that answers. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Okay, great. <laughs> I mean, you know, college is great. Uh, I think college is uh, so fun and we can often talk about things in college that uh, are difficult to talk about in high school uh, and are difficult to talk about in high school largely because of um, the way California and other states shape their educational standards. Um, they usually require a great deal of consensus uh, for anything to be on a high school curriculum, right? And by the time it's, um, it appears on your curriculum, I almost like to think it's like a oatmeal. You know, I mean, it's like been boiled so long uh, that a lot of the most uh, interesting flavors have been cooked out of it, right? And so a lot of my uh, students who come from high school, they often report that they hated history 
they hated social studies until they came to college uh, and they got this version, uh, which was uh, a bit more lively, right? Okay, so yeah, uh, Ms. Steuben Brock has also asked, are there migration maps that go along with what you were saying? Yes, I mean, there are to uh, in the class itself, I love maps uh, and, I, and I love uh, sharing maps with my students. And so over a 10 week term, I don't think there's a week where I don't use maps. <laughs> so, uh, and if you're interested in the class, and by the way, if any of you are interested in the class, it's relatively easy for me to add you uh, to the class on Gaucho Space. So if, especially if you're a teacher uh, and you would like to take this class along with my undergraduates, you're very welcome to do that, right? Okay. Wow, all the questions. There's 22 questions now, and there's no way I can possibly answer <laughs> it. Right. Uh, does this also compare to immigration rules? Yeah, uh, some of these questions are not in any particular order. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm uh, not getting to your question. How do you think climate change will impact American migrants? Okay, well, Ms. Aguirre, uh, I think that um, it'll make a lot of things worse. I mean, I, I also think that uh, here in California, and maybe many of you may have experienced it already, we may already see a lot of climate migration already. Like uh, we've had massive forest fires. Uh, Santa Barbara is quite lovely, except when it's on fire. In the last 10 years, uh, at least six of them have been full of fire, right? Uh, there may be a point where Cal you know, a whole chunks of California may be uninhabitable. And, and given the um, like hurricane activity in the Gulf Coast, uh, you know, the, the Gulf Coast of the United States may not be safe uh, if uh, uh, weather patterns continue to worsen and if storms get larger. And so I think uh, uh, climate change has already impacted uh, migratory trends within nation states and certainly across nation states. Uh, in the last part of my class, we discussed Syria uh, and the uh, Syrian refugee crisis. That really was uh, the result of a five-year famine uh, and, and uh, drought in Syria, uh, where the agricultural economy had collapsed. Now, Syria and Syria's refugees really are an example of what climate change and climate migration may look like, and it's scary. It's, it's very frightening, right? And uh, if anything, uh, we may need robust national governments and international bodies that get ahead of these problems uh, before they overwhelm us. Right. And so I, I think uh, the one huge area of research has to be climate change uh, and its impact on migration. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'm so sorry I can't see you all <laughs> because uh, the questions keep coming. Uh, yeah, given what you said about this class can be a rude awakening. Uh, <clears throat> Well, okay, so Ms. Jones asked me, given what you've just said about how this class can be a rude awakening for many students about the complex reality we face, what do you hope students will do with what they learn in your class? Right? How do you support their empowerment to do something with what they learn? I think uh, the class uh, has so many different aspects. Uh, what I tell my students is the class has so many different aspects that if you're interested in the climate change part, uh, you can spend your life doing that. If you're interested in uh, methods of enforcement and what immigration detention and deportation look like, you can spend an entire life doing that. Uh, going to graduate school, going to law school, all of these are good ideas. I mean, there's no shortage of ways that we can uh, participate and contribute uh, to solutions to these problems. And uh, I'm, one, uh, I mean, the biggest lesson I would like to convey is that it's going to require lots of people uh, working in multiple directions uh, to get a handle on all of these things. And so that's why, you know, I think it's worthwhile uh, to teach classes like this one, right, uh, to inspire students uh, and to get them to think about their education, not so much as something that makes them better off, but something that can make all of us better off. Are you aware of any UCSB colleagues that are examining? Well, yeah, I mean, I am. <laughs> okay, so uh, Forrest Mori uh, asked me, are you aware of any UCSB colleagues? Uh, UC Santa Barbara has uh, developed an unusual cluster of scholars who are working on climate change. They are in multiple departments, obviously in places like environmental studies, 
uh, but in the, in the ethnic studies department, uh, in fem studies, in um, sociology, uh, in political science, there isn't really a department in the social sciences that doesn't have at least one or two or three or five faculty members uh, working on these issues, right? And so, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this is a uniquely uh, wonderful place, I think, for younger uh, students to come and study things like climate change. Uh, <clears throat> can you talk about the, okay, so I have a, another question about, can you talk about the, I wonder how these are ordered. Are they ordered chronologically, Marcus? Yes, they're they're ordered. Um, yeah, they're 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 kind oh, of. Oh, by the time I yeah. Can you talk yes. about the legality of Trump's Muslim ban? Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, by himself as an executive, it's probably unconstitutional. However, if the entire Congress, both the House of Representatives and the Senate and the President of the United States, agree to ban all Muslims from the United States, uh, that would probably be legal, uh, and it's largely because. Uh, under the Chinese exclusion cases and under the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the idea is that the sovereign nation state, the United States of America, can exclude people it doesn't want. And Congress and the president have broad discretion to identify who that is, right? I would answer and say that when the executive, when Donald Trump uh, excludes Muslims, that's clearly unconstitutional. When two branches of government, though, agree that Muslims should be included, then, then there's greater constitutional uh, grounds for that. Now, I, I hope uh, and sincerely hope that that never happens. And I think part of the, the, <clears throat> the thing about American public law is it's just so democratic now, right? And uh, it's so important to vote. Uh, it's so important to be politically engaged, right? So as a result of taking the class, I hope more of my students are motivated to vote uh, and to participate in public life, right? Because I think it is possible uh, that the United States can enact something like a Chinese Occlusion Act again. Uh, and uh, it certainly enacted rules against poor migrants to the United States, all of which are uh, have been legal, uh, and there have been no uh, robust challenges against that. And so if we want to be a country that is more receptive to poor people, that admits more refugees, we have to elect a government uh, that, that uh, has those values, right? And I think this is uh, uh, just... Uh, you know, a part of the beauty of teaching at a major research university or, or teaching at a college or university is that the whole idea behind a college and university is that it's supposed to make us better citizens. It's supposed to make us more informed citizens, right? In light of, and just to give you a sense, in light of how interconnected we are through international airports, uh, you know, just thinking that we're going to get at migration problems by building a wall you know, people are just going to fly over that thing, right? So I, I think we need to have uh, serious discussions about what's going to work, what's not going to work. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> that, that, um, yeah, I keep, I keep getting interrupted. Yeah, <laughs> <good question. laughs> so, um, I'm thinking this, um, <laughs> there are quite a few um, folks who are asking about how to enroll in the Gaucho Space course. So... You know, if you send a note to me, okay, so I am relatively easy to find. You just type John Park UCSB, and uh, you can pull up my email, uh, you can pull up my website, you can pull up uh, my whole professional life. And if you just send me an email, uh, <clears throat> then I can take down your name, uh, and then after uh, the term starts, I can um, let you see uh, all the materials that my, my students see. Right? And I, yeah. Um, I'll put your name, I'll put your email address in the chat box too, for people to, if they need to email you, I can put it in the chat box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, okay, awesome. And I think, I mean, we have about five more minutes, so, gosh. Maybe yeah, you know, I, I uh, the uh, thing is sort of like quietly pinging whenever there's a new question. <laughs> it's like, you know, as I'm speaking, it's like, yeah. Uh, could you spell out the book title in the chat? I'd love to read it. Oh. Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, hmm, how best to do that? <laughs> Again, if you send me an email, I can reply. And in fact, hey, all of you, uh, if you are, if you would really like an answer to your questions, uh, please let me know. So, uh, Jace Bradley, early in the presentation, he said California was once the heart of an anti-Chinese movement. Oh, yeah, I mean, 
uh, I don't even know why I'm laughing. I mean, some of these things, again, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, a lot of these things are not funny, but I feel like uh, I teach topics in race and law and immigration that are so grim uh, that if you didn't find some sense of humor, <clears throat> you would kind of go crazy, right? So this, uh, this illustration is, uh, uh, the official title for that illustration was a Statue for Our Harbor. And it was a reference to the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. <laughs> but the idea is that if Chinese people kept coming to San Francisco, uh, this would be the statue that they erect. And you may not be able to see it, but it says the ruin to white labor, diseases, and morality and filth. So yeah, California was by far uh, the center and the most important center of the anti-Chinese movement in um, in the West Coast uh, in the 19th century. And that's largely why I became an Asian American studies professor. Uh, I took my PhD at the law school at Berkeley and I studied the origins of federal immigration law. And the origins of federal immigration law really are rooted in the period of Chinese exclusion in the late 19th century in California. And so, I mean, that, that was part of my early academic career. Right. And that is like, uh, it's become, uh, it was once when I started graduate school, um, it was really a fringe. It wasn't a very big discipline, but now if you go on Amazon and just type Chinese exclusion, you can find dozens of scholarly titles uh, about that. And I would highly recommend works by Erica Lee, Ronald Takaki. Again, if you send me a note, I will give you my favorite reading list uh, about that topic. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Xu was asked, I don't know if this has been taken, uh, been asked, but have countries like Mexico taken any measures to discourage emigration? So emigration is where you leave your country. Uh, immigration is where you come uh, to another country. So uh, the question is about has Mexico taken any measures? This? And uh, the reply quickly is no. Uh, that is uh, Mexico, uh, like many sending countries, uh, has learned that when Mexicans leave their country, go to a place like the United States, uh, they don't necessarily um, lose their connections to Mexico. And in, fi in fact, uh, they uh, earn a lot of money uh, and then send the money back to Mexico uh, and to relatives in Mexico. So lots of sending countries don't. So here in, um, uh, in this slide, I showed you that uh, lots of braceros did that. When many braceros came to the United States in the 1940s and 1950s, they worked in agriculture and sent something like 25 to 30 percent of their income uh, back to support members of their family. In some instances, it's a lot more. Yeah, uh, that kind of pattern. Uh, and in, in immigration studies, we refer to that as remittance. Remittance is where a worker in a, another country sends money back home uh, to support their relatives. Yeah. Uh, because of restrictions against the poor, uh, uh, billions of dollars now flow across international, and in fact, money uh, moves across international boundaries much more freely than people. Uh, and a surprising amount of money uh, flows between poor families working, or poor family members working in affluent countries, sending money back home. And in most of those instances, the sending countries do not uh, restrict immigration. And in fact, uh, uh, in some countries, like in the Philippines, the Philippine government over the last 20 years has encouraged immigration, right? And it's encouraged uh, highly skilled workers and poorer people to work abroad, earn higher incomes than they would in the Philippines, uh, and then to um, send money to support their family members. Okay, so uh, would you say that immigration law, uh, would you say that immigration law is different for people of different races and ethnicities? Well, uh, uh, no. I mean, uh, one of the things about American law after 1970 is it is more race neutral, right? So Congress hasn't passed a Chinese exclusion act or, you know, something so uh, obviously racist. But I do think that American public law has different impact uh, based on uh, where people are. And so what I mean by that is that um, when the Americans wrote the Immigration Act of 1965, there were provisions for skilled labor. And in fact, the provisions for skilled labor dated back to the Immigration Act of 1952, shortly after World War II. Uh, and in 1952 and 1965, uh, the United States wanted to admit people who were highly skilled and highly educated. Uh, when Congress is passing those rules, though, 
they are primarily thinking of Europe. Uh, and if you were to look at the world in 1952 or 1965, uh, most of the leading universities were still in Europe. Uh, most of the people who would have benefited uh, under the skilled migration categories would have been European. Uh, what the Americans didn't expect uh, and what I don't think anyone really expected was that in the post-war world, especially after 1950, Asian countries began to make massive investments in higher education. Right? And the, uh, the pattern unfolded in places like the Philippines, in South Korea, and in Taiwan first. But after 1990, when the uh, Indian uh, government gave up on socialism and the Chinese government gave up on communism, <laughs> both of those governments then made massive investments in higher education. This has largely shaped uh, the migration of highly skilled people uh, from Asia to the United States, right? And so the law didn't change. What changed was Asia changed, right? So, uh, and policies in Asia, within Asian states that supported uh, large and massive educational infrastructure uh, resulted in the migration of large numbers of highly skilled people from Asia to the U.S. And what I want to tell my students, and I would, you know, convey to you, is that uh, the, the population of highly skilled migrants from Asia coming from Asia to the United States is a very, very tiny fraction of the population of Asia. That is, in China and in India, uh, the majority of people in China and India are still very, very poor. We don't see them here because our immigration rules don't select them uh, to come to the United States. We only see the ones um, who have middle class, upper middle class, uh, and affluent backgrounds. And even though they are a tiny fraction of, uh, of the population of India and China, India and China are both vast countries. They are billions of people. I mean, the population of each of those countries is five to six times larger than the entire United States. And so uh, a small fraction of a gigantic number is going to produce a big number, right? So in uh, large numbers of Indians and, and Chinese who've come to the United States since 1990, they too have benefited from pro profound changes in their state's uh, policies toward, uh, toward education. And that's why we see that, that pattern continuing. Wow. So many questions and so Yeah, hey, you know, I mean, I, I love this class. <laughs> you know, and, and hey, I can talk about this for a long, long time. And in fact, for this book, uh, you know, I found the topic so fascinating that I wrote a fairly lengthy book that I've assigned for students who are taking a class. And, and you, know, you, can, you can easily find that online. And, yeah, and <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I, I know that we're past five. You know, I'm fine staying on a little longer uh, if, if you have other questions, but I think the rate of your questions is going to exceed my ability to answer <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm sorry if I can't get to all your questions, but yeah. So for example, Anita Howe asks, what time period do you believe is the worst for immigration? And you know, I think uh, uh, that is a complicated question. So what time period is the worst? In some ways, uh, now is probably the worst time to be a poor migrant uh, anywhere around the world, right? So right now is, uh, is that. Um, and certainly uh, before 1965, between about 1920 uh, and 1965, uh, that was the period in American history that saw the fewest migrants uh, come to the U.S., right? So in the period, the 40 years before, between 1880 and 1920, right, uh, nearly 25 million people uh, came from Europe to the United States. That, that was a huge uh, chunk of people. Uh, uh, that was kind of like the high point uh, of American immigration. And uh, now, after 1965, uh, despite... Um, the catastrophic rules against people who are poor, right, uh, uh, a very significant fraction of the United States population uh, is foreign born, right, and um, they are so mixed, uh, and they include everyone from <coughs> uh, farm workers and, and people who are uh, disp dispossessed and live on the margins of the United States uh, to college professors, <laughs> you know, attorneys and, and uh, politicians at the highest levels of government. I mean, I think that, you know, immigration is such that um, when I think, of, and it's so subtle and yet powerful, when I think of Barack Obama, I think of the son of an immigrant, right? So his father was a student from uh, Kenya, 
went to Hawaii and then to Harvard, but he really was an immigrant, right? And um, fell in love with an American and, and there's Barack Obama, right? <laughs> uh, in this uh, coming election cycle, right? Uh, even though Donald Trump has been so anti-immigrant, he's married to an immigrant, right? So the first lady of the United States is an immigrant. Uh, the last time a first lady was an immigrant uh, was in the 18th century. So, like, you know, I mean, uh, uh, even in Donald Trump's life, uh, immigrants are unavoidable. Uh, and then in this coming presidential election, you know, Kamala Harris is also uh, the, the daughter of immigrants. Uh, both her parents uh, were immigrants. One was from India, uh, one was from the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, in so many ways, if you just pay attention, uh, you'll realize that uh, American public life is just full of immigrants and it's full of immigrants everywhere.